produção da soja e da pecuária, que só é, beneficia grandes fazendeiros. Since 1956, the state of Rondonia has owed its name to this man, Marshal Rondon, wholehearted defender and champion of the Indians in the past, in supposedly more inhumane times. <laughs> Today, his respectful message is diluted in the pool of ambitions and avarice of those who rule this Amazon territory. These human beings seem not to exist, to count, for those who govern Rondonia. The Akunsu tribe is made up of just six survivors, and it is around them that this film is centered. This hyper-realistic portrait seeks to return to these people their dignity, which is as fragile as bohemian crystal. Ururu, the grandmother of the group, carries on in spite of everything, seeking her treasure. The sacred dye of the seeds of the Uruku plant. Although condemned to extinction, the Akunsu surrender to beauty, to their customs, to their ancestral power. They dye their hair the color of blood with this jungle cosmetic, just as their ancestors did here for centuries, long before the arrival of their murderers. Todos esses grupos humanos, all of these groups of humans, are subjected to economic pressure. And this pressure takes the form of ranches, the large soybean plantations which are beginning to arrive, and the removal of the wood, which is always the first step. The start of all the destruction is exploiting the wood, and later the access to the large ranches and other aspects in which the state takes part such as the construction of roads and hydroelectric projects. All of this is a part of a process which we call development and which involves these people. So here in this place, we have almost all of the threats I have mentioned. We have the wood, the ranches, and these Indians are threatened. And now the soybeans are coming in. This is therefore a process which poses a threat to them in every way. Rondonia's 240,000 square kilometers represent 3% of Brazil's territory, an area equal to approximately half that of Spain. But it appears that this territory's million and a half inhabitants do not wish to share it with the natives. The jungle is losing ground, and with it, its direct descendants, the people of the jungle. Those who thousands of years ago inherited this green treasure, which today they roam as captives. Rarely do the Akunsu cross the frontier, It's almost impossible to see them out in the open, exposed, outside their beloved jungle.
But today, our camera has captured one of these dangerous forays. At the very gates of their house, where until just one year ago the trees were as tall as cathedrals, today there graze thousands of cattle. The Akunsu defend themselves with words and arrows from a mammoth process bearing down upon them to squash them like ants. These images are just a symbol, an exclusive document. A handful of people outraged at the very gates of hell. These two families have less and less territory. Two adult males and four women live beneath the same roof and the same threat. Where they feel most safe and at home is in the lap of their mother, the jungle. They cannot or should not leave this leafy refuge. 26,000 hectares surrounded by an 81 kilometer perimeter if they want to stay alive. Here they are still the kings, monarchs held captive in a kingdom in danger of extinction, of a glorious era in whose garden human nature mixes with the rest of the animal kingdom as equals. On this occasion, Konibu has gone out to hunt with his two wives and their daughter. <laughs> the hummingbirds are happy to see them here one more day. The jungle stirs with their passing and its spirits prepare themselves for the festival of life. Where they drink, everyone drinks. Water is a communal treasure, and here the fate of man and animal is written with the same ink. Balance has been the key to coexistence for centuries, and today the Akunsu Indians are at a disadvantage. The women never hunt, but in the absence of men, Mopeka bears the bows and Mopé the arrows with little success. There can be no doubt that these Amazons waste their munitions, weapons they have had to take up only recently, forced by the attacks of the white man, who have left them without male hunters. They will undoubtedly learn, but we do not know if they will have the time they need, because others want to hunt these Indians to steal their land and cut down their trees. <laughs> While trying to shoot, the bow gets away from this young woman. These images are both moving and extremely sad.
Once again, it is Kunibu who keeps the expedition going. In the waters of this stream, there is plenty of protein to feed everyone. But they have to get at it, and this is not a technique that can be learned overnight. It takes patience and wisdom to survive in Amazonia. Eight hundred kilometers away, the government of Rondonia simply ignores the existence of these remote peoples. On the walls of the headquarters, we find an artistic representation of the future that would await them if it were up to the governor. It has taken Ivo Casol several days to agree to our interview, but once we start, he's in his element convinced of the evils of a respectful and just Indian policy. So you think that in Rondonia, there are no isolated Indians? No. I can't guarantee that we don't. As governor, I don't know whether we have unknown tribes. All of the Indians living in Rondonia are tribes which have been recognized. And what happens is that in many places, they say that they are Indians, but in truth, they are people who came here a long time ago from other countries, such as Bolivia, occupied a territory, and are treated as if they were Indians, and have their space preserved by law. Suddenly they want to protect that area. They go and get half a dozen Indians from another indigenous area, and bring them here to try to hinder development. This has happened here in the past. That happened. Why? Because their interests are, the larger the amount of native land, the more protected territory there will be. Therefore, if there are any unknown tribes here, it's not that they've come by themselves. It's because someone took them from someplace else and put them here to create another indigenous area. But the oldest man in the village does not stand alone in the face of danger. His energy is infinite. It's in the air, in the trees, in nature itself, from which he takes it and shares it out amongst his loved ones. <coughs> Kunibu does not know the origins of the catastrophe threatening his people. The Akunsu nation once numbered in the thousands, just six of which still hold out today. <coughs> America. They are the entire world, and the governor is either ignorant or evil. There is information about 11 places in the state of Rondonia where there may still live unknown tribes. Here we have small groups of humans. We have the Akuntsu with six people. The Kanoe, with three people, two of whom recently died under circumstances which were at the very least mysterious, which we are trying to uncover, but are finding it very difficult. And an Indian who we call the Indian of the Hole, who is just a few kilometers away, some 15 or 20. And he is the last survivor of an ethnic group. It's quite dramatic. All of these people have been held captive in a small piece of jungle. The Brazilian government gave us the power and the law as well, which was an extremely important piece of the puzzle, so that we could close this reserve to the rest of the world. 
aqui dentro, and try to approach these people nos and try desses povos e tentássemos o que vamos fazer. But what are we going to do? Tentássemos do what? Fazer o quê? O contato Peaceful de contact de has already been made with them. Mas o que vamos But what fazer? are we going to do? What future awaits these people? É There is little future. Little can be done. A única coisa the only que thing that we mean to do is to make life less difficult for these people. Os dias menos difíceis para essas pessoas. In the native land along the Omere River, another man wanders, disoriented and on the defensive, the Indian of the whole. He belongs to a different tribe from the Akunsu, of which we have only these two photographs given to us by the National Indian Foundation, the section of the Ministry of Justice that seeks to protect him. The Indian of the whole is the only one who may still exist because all of the others have died. To survive, he digs holes, holes up to two and a half or three meters deep, more or less a meter and a half square. And inside, he puts extremely sharp two-meter spears. Very dangerous ones, which he covers, and if you're walking along and fall in, just imagine if you fell into a trap like that. In the jungle where he lives, there are tons of them, dozens. When we managed to reach his home, he wasn't there anymore. And there was a huge hole, some three meters deep, but without spears. So we imagine that this must be some kind of security system, which he uses for his own protection. We believe he's still alive, because up till now, from the very first day, he has always run away. He refuses to make contact. And I would do the same. If I arrived home and they had killed my entire family and everyone around me, I would try to protect myself without letting myself be seen. And that's what he does. Ten years ago, the National Indian Foundation's Department of Unknown Tribes set up in the area. They have banned everyone from our world from passing through here to protect these Indians who are condemned to death. Every day they tell me, we no longer have the will to live. What are we going to live for? We want to die. We want to go into the jungle, take the poison root, and commit suicide. The men died out, and only the women remained. And so the women went out to hunt and do the things that the men had always done. The Indians we have here are the remnants of their history. They are the ones who didn't want to commit suicide. The only alternative to collective suicide was trust, and since 1995 they have surrendered to it. Since then, these distrustful Indians have come to know the kinder side of the white man's world. This operation is staffed by brave and caring men and women who devote their lives to those who are weaker, under the leadership of Moacir Cordeiro and directed by Sidney Pozuelo. <laughs> Amelia, the front of contact nurse, knows the medical history of each of the natives. So we ask her about the health of Ururu, the old woman of the group. 
She's got an iron constitution. Because if she actually gets sick, it's because the white man has brought the illness here. If she has some pain, it's a natural result of her age. Rheumatism, joint pain. But if she gets sick, it's because of the illnesses that come from the outside. Because none of those here would get sick if people didn't bring in the illness. The flu could kill them all, wipe them out. Because this is a tribe which is virtually extinct. Only this small part remains, and if no contact had been made with them, today there would be none left. Another frightened and hunted person enters our story with a purposeful stride. She comes to visit her neighbors. In days gone by, they were her enemies, but today they are her blood brothers, comrades in hardship and misfortune. She is Tiramandu, a Kanoe Indian, who has had a son by the man whose hand she holds. Years ago, before the white man colonized Rondonia's jungle, the Kanoe and the Akunsu could not even stand each other. But today they form an alliance against their common outside enemy. Buddha is Tiramandu's brother, the third and last of a tribe that was contacted in 1994, prior to the Akuntsu. Despite their clothing, they still preserve their Indian soul, wounded but intact. The ritual moves forward, and the Akuntsu display their sharp weapons, the essence of their hunter souls, before the eyes of their neighbors, like excited hosts. We now hear the unceasing refined melody of the matetos, flutes from which the akunsu will not part while they still live. Beating time with chestnuts tied to the knee, the music and dance dramatize the hymn to humanity so enjoyed by this mother and her son. Inevitable melancholy for the first peoples of America, for whom our development has left no escape. Ururu and her son, Bubake, prepare for the Festival of the Senses. Everything is ready for them to fly high. To start, this 80-plus-year-old woman removes the jewelry which pierces her nose so that she can sniff more and better. <coughs> With the help of a reed, Pugapia lifts a vegetable drug to the nostrils of her husband. This snuff from the Anjiko or Yopo tree 
is used on few occasions and is highly hallucinogenic. This is a social drug. Everyone takes part in its consumption, but without frivolity. Our camera has captured the seriousness of their faces. Safely united, this morning they seek out another dimension, another sensory territory to make them less vulnerable in the face of the cruel reality which grips them. The drug takes effect immediately and loosens the mind and the tongue of this wounded woman. Fifteen years ago, when she returned home from hunting with her brother, she found their village filled with corpses. Dozens of Kanue had been murdered by the timbermen. The exorcism begins. Tiramantu is going to clean the bad blood of each and every one of those present. This ritual is one of the most meaningfully suggestive anthropological documents we have ever seen. Before disaster came, this woman was her people's shaman, the transmitter of an electrical energy all of the Amazon tribes take from the earth. Today, after years of silence, she acts and works for her friends, once her enemies, the Akuntsu. One by one, she moves over their vital organs to repair them, to make them strong to face what is bearing down upon them. Although it may seem strange to us, this is pure culture, a sacred act in the religious temple of the jungles along the Omede River. The son, little Oberaika, takes part in the ritual with his mother. From his point of view, he's more interested in the magic, in the touch of this hallucinating grandma. The wasted land hurts this morning more than ever, and these people cry for it, like good children for their mother. Together with the state of Bará, Rondonia, located in the northern part of the country, is the bloodiest wound in all Amazonia. The savage deforestation of recent years is endangering that ecological equilibrium about which politicians talk so much and do so little. Five million cows have been brought onto native land, and with them the guile of the landowners, 
who obstruct the work of human rights defenders with impunity on a daily basis. Many indigenous areas, which were created in Rondonia, are not really native. Many Bolivians and people from other countries were put here solely to preserve the jungle. You can see it for yourself. If the reserve has already been created, we're not going to question it. Now, what I can assure you of is that I don't know of any region in the state of Rondonia, no place where there is a native reserve, where ranchers are destroying bridges and roads to prevent the National Indian Foundation from reaching it. The government of Rondonia tells us that they know nothing of the boycott of the great ranches. But the state's federal police frequently receive complaints from members of the National Indian Foundation, threats, demolished bridges, and the dramatic everyday existence of those who defend the law. We've already had two sudden deaths, which to this day have not been explained, and which coincided with visits and access by people not authorized to be there including uh, Nor Duarte himself, when he went with other people. And well, when these deaths took place, it was very difficult for us to get the Indians out because the road was impassable. What's more, we couldn't get out by car because the gates of the reserve were blocked, gates which, incidentally, are in an area delineated by law. And this is what forced the nurse and one of our assistants to carry the dying Indians on a stretcher for 13 kilometers in the middle of the night. One name has come up in the conversation with the police captain in this meeting, recorded in the city of Villena. Antenor Duarte, owner of 35 ranches, who has been tried several times for Indian massacres both on and off his property, and whose privileged connections have helped him to dodge prison. In this recent report, we read what many other times before has been the precursor to murder, words addressed to a National Indian Foundation worker in a menacing tone. You will see what will happen. Antenor, Antenor Duarte. Duarte. What does that name mean to you? Very bad. Too much. He is one of the most evil landowners in the state of Rondonia. He kills, and nobody says anything. This is a serious problem. But people don't dare speak out. There have already been people who have had to go, who were forced to leave here, because if you talk, you can't live in this place. His gunmen won't give you a moment's rest until you go. The whites, the powerful, the politicians, the ranch owners, they prefer to see these poor human beings, human beings like you and me, they prefer to see them dead so they can put livestock in their place. And that's the honest truth, the honest truth. And all of this is in the name of progress. But for us, it's a giant step backwards for mankind. Meanwhile, in their world, in the heart of a peaceful bubble of serenity and quality of life, the Akunsu rest inside their tois. These two large houses, made from acai and inajá palms, lie close to their papaya fields, surrounded by their mythical universe. <laughs> In one of the houses live Uruku and her son Pupake.
ต่อไปครับครับตอนเขาไปยืมหมดเขาไปยืมหมดเขาไปยืมหมดตัวนี้เป็นมือตัวนี้ก็ไปแจ้งพี่รอพี่เชิญตัวนี้คุยแจ้งแบบที่เราเนี่ยคุยแจ้งก็วาดก็ตอบตอบตีบ They talk and swing in their hammocks, preparing to rest now, sheltered from the blazing sun. But it's the light of justice that they urgently need. The other hut, located opposite, Is the house of Kunibu, his two wives Tiarui and Pugapia, and his daughter Inodei. Here they also observe the siesta, that universal restorative ritual which some believe to have been patented by Spain. These people's love of birds is driving them crazy. Their toucan is happy, and for him, a siesta is a human thing. Hushing him is a matter of skill. The youngest member of the family closes his beak so as not to break the sweet spell of the house. The fluty sound of the matete transports us. Under this roof, one breathes in culture, humanity, and above all, peace. How is it possible for the government responsible for a civilized country like Brazil to permit these people to be killed with impunity? And how is it possible that in the 21st century, the rest of the international community looks the other way? In Porto Velho, Rondonia's capital, we visit the remains of an unfinished conflict. Locomotives, rusty and ruined railroad cars from a railway that was designed to conquer new horizons and deflower the jungle. The powerful nature of the Amazon did not really collaborate, however, and violently defended itself. The Madeira Mamore railroad line is a clear example of the blood-soaked historic attempt to conquer southern Amazonia. In Rondonia, two countries, Bolivia and Brazil, reached an agreement. One, Bolivia, sought a land route to the Atlantic, and Brazil sought the mineral wealth of its neighboring country, of Bolivia. Between the two, they came up with the idea for a train which would run the length of the Madeira River, kilometers and kilometers of jungle. Thousands of people died, defeated by malaria. Nature took its revenge on man on this occasion. However, and despite the fact that the driving force bore this name, Marshal Rondon, terrible things are still going on in Rondonia, now in the 21st century. And if you'll allow me the expression, they're still getting away with murder in the struggle for land. And I'm sure that Marshal Rondon, a pioneer in the defense of the natives, this current history of modern Brazil, contemporary Brazil, I'm sure he wouldn't like it.
It's not only the natives that have suffered the crimes of those who think themselves the owners of Rondonia. The landless movement, which we visited at the trade union in Vienna, has paid for its principal demand with dozens of human lives. What they seek is a parcel of land on which to support their families. It was August 9, 1955. At three in the morning, they attacked us, killing right from the start. The first person to fall was even a military police officer, a good friend of ours, who was killed by the police themselves, those who were in league with the bosses in order to justify it so that they could attack everyone. The second victim was a minor, a seven-year-old girl. They said that it was a stray bullet, but no way. It was on purpose, to incite us, so then we would attack the police. And that's how it all started, from three in the morning to six that afternoon, when the shooting stopped. The Corumbiara massacre has still not been cleared up. Antenor Duarte was detained as an instigator in connection with it, but set free once again for a lack of evidence. Dead people burnt on the spot. Burnt merchandise, mountains of burnt rice, cans of oil. They killed children. They killed adult men, women. Nobody has ever said anything until today. Parece que na madrugada do dia 9, o acampamento foi cercado por todos os lados e começou o que foi o massacre de Corumbiara. Dozens of landless families, forgotten by a government that had promised them land and a future in Rondonia, had occupied a private ranch. Without thinking twice, the landowners, together with the police, attacked the camp in a war without limits. Once again, Blood was spilt in Amazonia, where death does not distinguish between peasants and natives because it is always sent by the same people. In Corumbiara, it began first with the massacre of Indians. I know a ranch where more than 400 Indians died. It was the ranch of Antonio Jose, one of the region's landowners, who's now left here and who killed a great many Indians. Today we have Amir Lando as a senator of our republic, a man who now has his land because he defended Antonio Jose before the law for the massacre of Indians, Indians and prospectors. The senator Amir Lando, today a minister in the government of Lula da Silva, that great example for Brazilian society, has a dark past connected with the colonization process in Rondonia. With annual growth of 20%, this Amazon state has gone from a reported 37,000 people in the 1950s to a million and a half today. And of course the Indians, who nobody counts, are in the way. So you say that poison sugar is used to kill the Indians? Of course. It's the best way to get rid of them. The Indians really like sweet things. Smoke, alcohol, new and forbidden things for them. And their extinction came in this way. Although we can't look into it fully, because there are some who still use these methods. Not long ago, there were a great many Indians here. And the few that still remain, if the government did not protect them, They would disappear, because a good part of their land is already pasture land.
The most amazing jungle on the planet is in a losing battle in Rondonia. Swiss-type pasture land is taking over at an ecological and social cost we cannot afford to pay. And the end of the world is coming for the natives who are today treated like pariahs in their own home. Brazil exports more and more beef from this area. It sells this meat as green organic beef. Knowing what we know, can we really see it as such? The world often treats us as if we were the ugly duckling. They say that here, we are deforesting everything. But that's not the truth. At present, more than 75% of our jungle land is still intact. Many of our products from Amazonia were taken abroad. There are being many countries, whose names I'm not going to list, although the whole world knows who they are, who don't produce anything and sell products from here, saying they're from there. Some come as protectors of nature, but they are the real wolves disguised in sheep's clothing, telling everyone that we must take care of this, while they are taking everything themselves. From what I know of the governor, he is a businessman who has close ties to the timber industry. He receives a great deal of support from timber merchants. Also, if you check, you'll find that the Secretary of the Environment is a rancher. So you can well imagine that the government is not very motivated by environmental matters. Ranting only benefits the great landowners, who have many resources. Therefore, I wouldn't call it development, because it only benefits a small number of people. Many of them don't even live in Rondonia. They have land here only to invest in property, and they have no interest in bringing progress to the state of Rondonia.